Now, now we're going to present another award, and it's going to be a, a, it's a, actually a media award. And Bill, if I could take the liberty of kind of uh, stepping in, because this award is very special to me, because it's going to be presented to somebody that I've known for several years now. And I met him, when, and actually he thinks he's the presenter, but he's actually the person getting the award. <laughs> and I met him when he was with the Dallas Morning News. And I would go to Dallas on other business, and when I would go there, I, I would go, uh, Ruben, what are you thinking? You know, because it was columns and so forth. And uh, so we both have kind of swayed each other a little bit to agree on, on some things. But, but he's a great man. He's a great man. He's a great writer. And uh, Ruben Navarrete is, uh, is uh, also my compadre. He asked me to be his uh, godfather of his uh, youngest daughter, and I'm, I'm happy to do it. Him and Veronica, his lovely wife. Ruben is a nationally resyndicated columnist with the Washington Post Writers Group. He twice weekly, has column, his, his, his column appears twice weekly in more than seven, 175 newspapers. You've seen it in USA Today, The Washington Post, Hispanic Magazine. He, he was with the Union Tribune. His columns still come out there with The Washington Post. Now, at his first book, A Darker Side of Crimson, Odyssey of a Harvard Chicano, he went to Harvard, graduated of uh, Harvard, was published in 1993. Navarrete spent two years with the Arizona Republic as a reporter, then twice weekly news uh, columnist. During a seven-year span as a freelance writer, Navarrete wrote articles for the Los Angeles Times, the Chicago Tribune, and his hometown paper, the Fresno Bee. Navarrete is a native of California's San jo Joaquin Valley. And to me, really, uh, uh, Ruben uh, exemplifies the true spirit of accomplishing what we can accomplish with an education and with a commitment to doing what is right, standing on the side of love. You don't have to agree with everything he writes, but I know we agree with a lot that he writes. And he really does research. He's, uh, he's a great, great man, a great father. He has three wonderful children. So Ruben, congratulations for, uh, for, for come on up here, Ruben, for receiving the... Uh, Border Angels uh, Media Award. I want to thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you for your tremendous uh, spirit, your writing, and so forth. So, Ruben, thank you very much. Muchas gracias, compadre. Thank you. Thank you. He, he lied to me. He tricked me. He, he tricked me. We came here to present an award to somebody else who I now am sure doesn't really exist. <laughs> He gave me this name, and I was sitting right there trying to I was I was sitting there trying to pronounce this name so I would get the name right, and this person doesn't exist. <laughs> and to top it off, I was trying to find a way to come up and, and before I introduced this fictional person and gave them this fictional award, I was going to try to go, you don't give Ruben Navarrete their microphone in a podium and not get a few words in, right? So I was trying to find a way to get this in and squeeze in a few words of my own to tell you about Enrique. So let me do that now. And, and thank you for this. Um, I'm going to say a word or two about, uh, about the work I do. And, um, and I think the price you pay sometimes for the work you do. Before that, I'm going to tell you Enrique's story, OK? Because it really sort of exemplifies this. A couple years ago, when, when we had our youngest uh, daughter, we did decide to pick a compadre. And I picked Enrique. I couldn't have picked a better compadre. And I picked him because he's a real person. He's, he's authentic. He's real. He's honest. I have written for 23 years about politicians. I have covered politicians at every level, in three different American cities, at the city council level to so the president of the United States for various presidents. And most of the politicians I've covered are full of crap. They say one thing, and then when they get in office, they do another. It's even been our experience, our gente, as if our gente haven't suffered enough. It's even been our experience to recently elect a president with 70% of the vote, who then turned around and deported 1.2 million people. True. By use of a program named Secure Communities. And those of us who railed against 1070, and Josefina is exactly right, this is a god-awful law in Arizona that's caught fire, right? Now you have versions in Alabama and Georgia and South Carolina. The premise of 1070 is that you use and rope local cops into the enforcement of federal immigration law, right? As the son of a retired cop, that offends me on various levels. Local cops should not be enforcing federal immigration law. All right, so now comes the punchline. The program Secure Communities is about what? 
It's about local cops enforcing federal immigration law. And basically, the only difference is instead of it happening on the street, it happens at the jail. So in Escondido, when somebody is pulled over and taken to the jail and processed, they're handed over to ICE, and through secure communities, uh, you basically have forced these local police departments around the country to deliver these illegal immigrants. This is Barack Obama's program. This is Janet Napolitano's program. This is John Morton, the director of ICE's. This is their program. This is how you get to 1.2 million Latinos, mostly deported. As I've said, nobody's that good at their job, okay? How in the world could somebody deport 1.2 million people in less than three years? The machine only takes 400,000 people a year before smoke starts coming out of the deportation machine, right? It's working at capacity. How is this possible? How do you deport more people than any president since Eisenhower in Operation Wetback in 1953, right? You do it through a program like Secure Communities. So the paradox for our community is that I rejoice with you in the defeat of Russell Pierce in Arizona. <laughs> who I knew then, who I know now, and who I assure you is no fan of mine. When he left, when he was voted out, I wrote a column for CNN, and the kicker at the end of it was, this chapter is closed in Arizona, evil has left the building. <laughs> but oh, if only life was so simple. Now that we've taken care of that dragon, thanks to people like Randy Parras, the activist in Arizona, who helped slay that dragon, now we have to pay attention to what people like Luis Gutierrez, the congressman from Chicago, is telling us about this administration and its deportation policies. Like it or not, we have to ask ourselves these hard questions about how it is that a president that enjoyed Latino support could turn around and deport 1.2 million people. And then you have Jan Napolitano come forward and say that next year we're gonna do even better. We're gonna have a robust, a more robust policy to deport more people, right? Noticing they only say this to non-Latino audiences. How about that for a coincidence? They say it at Chambers of Commerce and Christian Science Monitor breakfasts and the like. If ever there's a non-Latino audience, the message is very tough and very hard. When they go on Univision to Punto on Sunday morning, it's very soft, and it's in Spanish, and it's si se puede. And this is, my, well, this is my life, dealing with a good cop, bad cop of this administration. So anyway, just by virtue of saying that, I make friends on this side of the room, and I lose friends on this side of the room. But that's my job, that's what I do. The job of a journalist, at the end of the day, is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And you get to be, at this point, I mean, we all know about the horrible state of newspapers and this institution that I love and that I grew up with and how much I love newspapers as a whole. I make my living from newspapers in part. But, you know, to be the most widely read Latino columnist in the country at a time when newspapers are struggling is very humbling at the same time. But the way you get to this point, I think, is ultimately by just calling balls and strikes and not being blue or red. A few days ago, I was in Los Angeles at a meeting of Democrats and Republicans, but everybody was a Latino, and everybody there was against 1070, and everybody there was against these laws, and everybody there has it in their mind that this is a very difficult time for Latinos because demographics are changing and people are afraid and they are not going quietly into that good night. They are hitting us with everything they've got, right? All these states passing all these laws, it's all about fear. Many of them driven by Republicans, but when those Republicans hand, when they have those illegal immigrants in their custody, who do they hand them over to? They hand them over to Democrats, the Democrats who run the deportation program at ICE. So it's, it's a nice little, we have a nice little bipartisan arrangement going on. Who said the parties can't work together? They're actually are working together quite well, to our detriment, but they're working together quite well. And I was at this donor gathering, this, this meeting, and somebody introduced me and they said, you know what, <clears throat> Navarrete is one of my heroes. They said, because he doesn't have a little D after his name, and he doesn't have a little R after his name. He has an L after his name. Not a Democrat, not a Republican, not a blue, not a red, not a liberal, a Latino columnist who writes for people who cannot defend themselves and gives voice to people who don't have a voice. Like somebody else we know, and this is where I'll, I'll end talking about Enrique. 
the reason he's powerful and the reason he's influential and the reason people know him and the reason people respect him is not just because he stands up for people who don't have a voice and not just because he's done at great personal sacrifice and he's a hard worker, uh, but because he is authentic, because he is real, because what you see is what you get. And I remember a case, a story, at the National Council of Arasa Conference where John McCain was speaking and Enrique came up. This is how I'll end with this, my, one of my favorite stories. And John McCain's speaking and Enrique comes up and at this very moment, Cecilia Munoz, who was then the Vice President of the National Council of Arasa and is now the Chief Apologist for the Obama Administration. Well, at that moment, she saw Enrique and she knew immediately she did not want to give this microphone to Enrique because she knew that if she gave the microphone to Enrique, Enrique was gonna embarrass John McCain, right? So I'm watching this unfold, I'm in the room covering it, the National Council of La Raza, or as I refer to it, the National Corporation of La Raza, was sitting there protecting John McCain from Enrique Morones. And so they go through the line, they ask questions, and here's Enrique patiently waiting, right? Everybody else was wearing a suit and tie, he's wearing a Border Angel t-shirt. And he comes up, and just before he gets to the point, and basically Cecilia takes the microphone away and says, well, that concludes our program, right? And he said, and so at that very moment, he says, well, I didn't get a chance to ask my question. And now John McCain doesn't know what's going on because he knows he still has time. So he says, ask your question, he tells Enrique. And Cecilia is saying, no, 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 Senator, we have to go, we have to go, right? Right. At that moment, I think we pretty much understood which one of those two people belonged in the White House and which one didn't, but anyway. So Cecilia says, no, 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 Senator, we have to go. John McCain doesn't understand, we still have time in the program. So he says, ask your question. Enrique's looking at Cecilia like, well, I don't have the microphone. I swear, McCain takes his microphone and pitches it at Enrique. <laughs> and Enrique, with his baseball, a baseball background, the Padres grabs the thing, catches it in midair. And the crowd cheers. And Cecilia walks away dejected. And he got to ask his question. And I'll never forget that. This was an incredible thing to watch because this was John McCain and everybody else who comes before Enrique saying, give this guy the chance to ask his question. Give him a chance to say his piece. Give him a chance to speak for people who don't speak, have a, a, the ability to speak for themselves. And sometimes politica and organizations and politics and things like that get in the way and they try to prevent this man from speaking. But that particular day, he's had his say. He's had his, day, his say since then and we're all very proud of him. So I share this award with him, my compadre. Thank you for having me, and thank you for supporting this great organization.